Uh, okay, welcome back, uh, everyone, for the uh, the second session this morning. And uh, this morning we've got, uh, we're really uh, blessed with a couple of uh, really excellent speakers. And I think uh, this is really an opportunity to move past the uh, South China Sea, as wonderfully interesting as the, you know, the disputes in the South China Sea might be, uh, and, and think more broadly about um, in, uh, Chinese uh, 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 naval strategy and, and strategic thinking about the Indo-Pacific as a whole. And this session this morning we'll be getting some Chinese perspectives on that and later this afternoon uh, with Abhijit Singh we'll get um, an, an Indian counterpoint to that. Um, but this morning we're blessed to, uh, to, to have uh, Professor Yoji from um, Macau uh, University and before he went to Macau, um, he was, I think, for, at, for some years at uh, the University of New South Wales and has strong links with Australia. But I think uh, the, one of the, the, the great things about um, um, uh, Professor Yeo's work is that it, it, uh, he, he's able to surpass a lot of the rhetoric that we, we see uh, in talking about um, Chinese naval thinking and give us a very clear and articulate picture of the evolution of um, Chinese naval thinking. And um, then after uh, uh, Professor Yoji uh, uh, makes his presentation, we've got uh, Dr. Jian Zhang from ADFA who will give some thoughts um, as, as a counterpoint to uh, Professor Yeo's um, uh, presentation. So, if you'd like for me to, to welcome Professor Yeo, please. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Laurie, for your very kind invitation for me to attend this very important event. I lived here for six years doing my master and PhD. So each time I come back, I feel really nostalgic. Maybe the number of my return trips is exhausting <laughs> as we are moving towards the age of retirement. But anyway, this is the place I remember most fondly and solidly. Uh, I will begin my uh, speech with two questions to myself. The first one, does China have an Indo-Pacific strategy? Now I put it an uh, emerging Indo-Pacific strategy um, but I would say that uh, there is an emerging two ocean naval strategy by the Chinese People's Liberation Army. Uh, at the military level, uh, it is basically there, but still not finally approved by the political leadership. So it is not really official yet. And, but if we do recognize the central elements of the two ocean strategy, naval strategy, it could be interpreted as a kind of Indo-Pacific strategy because the focus, the naval focus has been shifted. Uh, I wouldn't say shifted, has been added another uh, di uh, di dimension from the West Pacific now to the Indian Ocean. We talked about it uh, during the tea break, that the short-term uh, concern, especially political concern, is of course South China Sea, Taiwan issues, uh, but long-term concern is of course in the Indian Ocean. Uh, the reason is that you know uh, China is kind of a confident or, or more confident that eventually they would have things under control in the South China Sea or in the Pacific or in the Taiwan Strait, but it is very, very difficult and long, long term for them to have anything under control in the Indian Ocean. So this is a word David mentioned, the vulnerability. Vulnerability will last. And when you have something under control, your worry is less intensified, but when something, you know, you cannot, uh, you know, go beyond, goes beyond your concern, that you plan first, you plan early. So this is still at the planning stage and uh, planning is both in terms of strategic design and more importantly, capability building. So that leads to my second question, does strategy matter? Um, 
I think I, I was the first one to publish the uh, Chinese blue water strategy in the West. My paper was published by the Pacific Review in 1991, uh, the Chinese blue water strategy. Now between 1991 to 2011, numerous people asked me, what do you mean by Chinese blue water power? Is there a blue water power associated with Chinese Navy? So I can't answer. Only after 2011, now this is no longer beyond doubt that China does have a naval uh, capability that can be described as a blue water power. So it takes a long time for strategy to be substantiated into uh, the power play or military employment of that strategy through power building, through capability building. Therefore, strategy does matter. It points to the direction, maybe a long-term evolutionary trend, but eventually it point, they will lead the people towards that direction and end it up. Maybe, now this is probably the year one for our Indo-Pacific concept debate in, at ANU, but when we come back in 2036, now, probably, no, it is already a reality rather than a conceptual debate or conceptual design. So we, we see, uh, you know, a long-term trend and that trend for the Chinese uh, is inevitable to happen because, uh, you know, one belt, one road, the economic interests, uh, sea slog, security challenges, all point to the direction of Indian Ocean. Okay, so with this, I just uh, finished my introduction, maybe a little bit too long, uh, but, but my next uh, point is the connection between the, let me say, in terms of Sino-Indian relations between the land border disputes and uh, uh, Indian Ocean access for the Chinese to get there. Um, now, this linkage, can be defined that uh, land border disputes with India still enjoy top priority, and uh, Indian Ocean access uh, is very often subject to that kind of concern. Now, in my book, I sorry, I shamelessly, you know, put my flare on the table, uh, not as request, requested by the publisher, Polity Press. Now, uh, <laughs> uh, in in that. Uh, uh, Book, I put this 1.2 war scenario. Um, that is, uh, it is relatively clear that there would be uh, prospects of a major maritime confrontation in the eastern and uh, eastern South China Sea, basically along the Chinese eastern flank. And when that happens, the Chinese strategic designers, especially military strategists, think of the Qing reaction from the land borders. For a long time, they think about land border dispute with India as a top threat. But today, uh, the top level threat has been the, along the Sino North Korean border rather than Sino Indian border. Uh, but still, um, this is a strategic challenge that China has very little means to answer if there is some major conflict uh, that breaks out. Uh, from the Chinese perspective, they have to deploy a defensive defense posture along the land borders uh, uh, for several reasons. Uh, first, the, in severe, in the superiority of Indian army vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese is already five to one in manpower. Uh, this is mountainous region. It's very difficult for the Chinese to launch offensive and most importantly, uh, maybe seven times more expensive to deploy a soldier in the Tibet than in the eastern part of the country. So all these factors put together, the defensive defense posture will be uh, dominating the Chinese uh, Indian uh, strategic planning. Uh, I think uh, the Indian Ocean concern is subject basically to that kind of strategic calculation. Um, this is the first uh, 1.5 scenario. The next 1.5 scenario may be less likely, but it is still a kind of prospect. That is, uh, if the land border dispute worsen, that will trigger or stimulate the Indians to go a big way on its eastward, eastward expansion strategy to move into the South China Sea or even beyond to the east 
South, South, South China Sea, uh, the, the Chinese have to be prepared for such a scenario. And uh, uh, Pramit uh, mentioned the, the relationship between the Indian strategic thinking on the South China Sea patrol earlier. I think that is quite logical and makes a lot of sense to me. However, now if the land border dispute worsen between China and the uh, China and India, uh, would India be still that kind of constrained? Uh, I just uh, doubt it. I think India Indians will take advantage of the South China Sea dispute in a more vigorous way than it is currently the case. Um, so generally, uh, along the land borders, it is defensive defense posture, PRA posture, and uh, along the Indian Oceans, along the eastern flank or east and south China Sea. Now, if we risk a level of simplicity, it's a kind of uh, um, defensive offense or even offensive defense, because it, moving into the Indian Ocean uh, is strategic strategically uh, forward and uh, uh, more importantly, uh, in the combat uh, gear. So it is more uh, combat, more offensive oriented over the time when the Chinese Navy does have the capability to do that. Uh, second, the linkage between the naval strategy in the context of o uh, Indian Ocean um, and the overall Chinese naval strategy so generally, we, we, to make things easier uh, for you to understand, we, you, I use three metaphors, or uh, the, what we call the one point, one zone, and the one line. One point is, of course, the top priority in terms of hierarchical order of the military planning. Of course, that is Taiwan Street. With the new government, pro-independence government in Taiwan, uh, I think the Chinese have been you know, concerned more about the immediate and the mid-term development in Taiwan Street more vigorously than uh, previous years. So one of the reasons why the Chinese were in such a hurry to build those islands uh, in the South China Sea was that, you know, after the regime change in Taipei, there would be virtually no possibility, no time for any kind of uh, projects reclaiming project to take place in the South China Sea. So this is a really uh, uh, subtle and very risky policy adopted by Xi Jinping that this is basically now or never. So they, they did it and they did it quite successfully <clears throat> in a way I always define, define uh, in my research on the Australian position between the United States and the and China, and I use this word, have the cake and eat it too. So don't you know, offend or don't pick the side too much that to annoy your security guarantor and uh, your meal ticket provider. Now, what, what, now, of course, this is an exaggerating way to, to describe the things, but if we can have the cake and eat it too. Now, for Xi Jinping, he, he did all these kind of projects in the South China Sea, on the one hand. On the other, China did not you know, hurt Sino-U.S. relationship, Sino-ASEAN relationship by a big, you know, big, big way. So uh, I think he has got it in such a way, but price is also very high. There is no doubt about that. So here uh, we see this uh, eastward expansion basically aimed to break the so-called two island chains. Uh, the purpose is to enlarge the defensive depths along the Chinese eastern flank, where the major capital cities, industrial centers are located. Towards south, uh, we call the intermediate zone. Uh, that is basically re related to Chinese domestic politics and uh, uh, <coughs> uh, sovereignty claims. Of course, it also expands the Chinese defense depths southward uh, over 1,005 1,500 kilometers, for example, the air defense has been extended towards the Spratlys uh, that provide a la much larger shelter, air defense shelter for the Chinese Hainan part uh, <coughs> territory than to the east. Now this is the Indian Ocean. Now this has to be done. It has to be done in a way 
because the political requirement and strategic demand from this one belt, one road uh, concept that is politically necessary for the military to follow the, the top pol the civilian leaders. But more, spe more specifically, this is about the SLOC uh, operations, SLOC safety, um, that is crucial uh, to the Chinese new concept, military concept called the frontier defense. Frontier defense means you know you protect the ex ever expansion of your security interests rather than territory boundaries. Uh, now here uh, is associated with the very concept of chi Chinese Navy, uh, which defines itself as a regional navy, which means that the overwhelming activities are in the, in the region. But the region, where the very word region is not a, geostrat is not a ge uh, geological term. It is related to the expanding uh, threats, source of threats and the economic expansion of the Chinese uh, you know, enterprises and the, uh, commercial interests. Though I, I use this word, we call this a reverse of the Mahanist sea power concept that is uh, during the Mahan era, you know, the gunboat went to the area first and the commercial ship followed. Now, in Chinese case, the commercial ship went first. Then the, the warship just come to protect them. Uh, so this is a uh, kind of sequency development, uh, but something quite new uh, in our naval development. In naval, uh, the, the next point is the evolutionary process, as I mentioned earlier. It is not one year, one decade, one belt, one road is a long-term strategic planning, uh, not a just a economic design. Now, just from my perspective, if the concept eventually materializes, all the smaller economies along road and belt will be sucked into a big magnetic stone. You now that creates a tremendous amount of asymmetrical economic dependence on the Chinese market. So that is the most important thing about Belt and Road concept, not the economic uh, design in the first place. Uh, rationality is very simple. You know, when the Americans cannot address the asymmetrical economic dependence of the region on the Chinese economy, all its security measures and efforts could not achieve its full, their full effect, as simple as that. So this, the, the Navy has taken this kind of uh, mission and the responsibility in its own hand to make sure that the one belt, one road concept to be materialized, <clears throat> not in full. There is never, the Chinese never believe that they could fully realize one belt, one road initiative. Partially, yeah, that is already good enough. So how to do it for the Chinese Navy, uh, South China Sea? Now it is projected to achieve a kind of a sea control apart from American involvement, that is vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the regional navies, that is relatively easy to achieve. But in the long, towards, along the long road to the Indian Ocean, it has to be carry a better group's job, uh, <clears throat> but that has to take at least 10 years from today that the first uh, battle groups would become fully operational against another major naval power. So there is a long way from now to at the end of decade when the second uh, indigenous carrier is operational initially. Uh, but generally speaking, now this uh, naval planning uh, based on carrier battle groups uh, is a practical carrier or the means uh, to move into the area um, in the Indian in Ocean or beyond. My, I put a lot of uh, criticism on this kind of planning. Uh, I, I de 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 describe it as the biggest strategic blunder that Chinese military has ever made. Uh, I'm myself a summer, sub submarine school advocacy um, advocate. I just feel just like the, the the person raises question in the previous section that you know this uh, carrier idea is so obsolete. It is very vulnerable, it cannot survive uh, in extended mm -hmm. sea battles uh, with pinpoint uh, missiles and the long range uh, you know, air strike capabilities. Um, so in a way, 
uh, carrier is a peacetime toy. It cannot be used in major sea battles. However, uh, if it gives the Chinese leadership a level of comfort, just like they, they just do it. <laughs> there, there's nobody. <laughs> there's there's nobody who can stop them. But the the issue is that now, from my perspective, you you can do all the things with carrier battle groups, and one condition: you have to survive. Now, from my perspective, they probably can survive one week, two weeks, or probably no more. But but anyway, so this is a uh, this requires. Additional arrangements, for example, uh, we call the chain of the bases. We don't have any, uh, for the, as far as the Chinese are concerned. The Djibouti is just a point of logistic supply. It has nothing to do with military base, uh, naval base in the first place. And they will seek a few more. Uh, Guada may be too far away in terms of protecting Chinese stocks. And we, we, when we talk about Chinese stocks, we, we talk about 13,000 miles and uh, in different directions. Just think about how many carrier battle groups you need to, to, to protect all these stocks. And uh, each carrier battle group is a huge drainage. So from my perspective, you know, I, I use this uh, we call the re reverse deterrence. That is, it is very difficult for you to protect your own slugs. That's fine, but it's a lot easier for you to disrupt your enemy's slugs. Now, that 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 job can be done much much easier, more effectively by submarines. Now, here, um, I think th this is a Chinese. We call the capability deficits. Uh, submarines. The majority of the submarines uh, in Chinese naval arsenal. Uh, conven conventional submarines are we call the shallow water submarines. They don't perform well. Uh, they cannot perform well in Indian Ocean. You know, someday I just read the the Chinese submarine got to Indian got to Sri Lanka and Pakistan. So what kind of submarine it was? It turned out to be I was briefed by somebody. It was a Sun class submarine. Sun class submarine is a conventional submarine, a little bit bigger than Kilo submarine. I think, yes, it's fine to get there. It's a different matter to engage in combat missions. So there are two different concepts. So eventually you have to have nuclear attack submarines. Or, you know, if you have too many carriers, you don't have much money left. OK. Um, so finally, um, it's a from midterm, from Immediate future to midterm, um, such conclusions. Indian Ocean as a long term planning target, that is beyond doubt anymore. Uh, but in the immediate future, let's say five years, uh, generally it is for the Chinese Navy, it's a it is a period of exploration, it is a period of knowing. Better the climate, the uh, the ocean bed situation, the storm, and those kind of very es essential elements that you need to plan your combat uh, in the high seas. Then, then that is followed by creating some presence, limited presence in the first place, then gradually to create a chain of presence. Uh, it is different from the the chain of what we call the pearl string of pearls as a different thing is more combat oriented, but what I'm saying here is more for showing flag for creating presence rather than for combat purposes. So that these two, the difference between these two concepts are is very very crucial. <coughs> um, so this act, this is basically what I term as access. Then to build the Indian Ocean. United the fleets, uh, carrier centered. Uh, I think that will, as I mentioned earlier, the the initial capability to engage in in the warfare with major powers is ten years from today. Now uh, with the United States, I don't not know, probably never. But the, the Chinese plan is to build a navy about half or two thirds of American naval strength. I think when that happens. The story would be different. Okay, I'll finish here. Thank you, Professor Yo. And I think, uh, to me, some of the fascinating things um, that uh, Professor Yo talks about is the debates in China between 
uh, those advocating basically a sea control strategy as against those debating um, advocating a sea denial strategy, and that's a uh, I think debates which have been you know um, uh, gone on forever among um, naval strategists, and maybe we can come back to that um, uh, a little bit later. Um, um, but uh, it, First, if I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Um, Xing Chang to uh, say some, uh, to have some comments on Professor Yeo's paper. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very pleased to be here. Thanks, David, uh, for inviting me to this very important, timely uh, conference. Because much of the policy and academic discussion on regional security issues focus too much on U.S.-China rivalry. And I think it's time for us to talk about uh, China and uh, India. So uh, it's a tough job to comment on Professor Yu's paper. And uh, as we all know that uh, Professor Yu, nobody knows the Chinese military more than Professor Yu in this uh, southern hemisphere. And uh, so what I'm going to do is that I just uh, quickly uh, say something which I found uh, disturbing from Professor Yu's paper. And then I will uh, try to challenge some of the strategy he presented. I do not want to challenge Professor Yu, but I just want to challenge the strategy. And uh, he presented uh, uh, as China's emerging Indo-Pacific strategy. OK, some of the disturbing uh, funding uh, presented in Professor Yu's paper is that uh, uh, I think the paper, and uh, I recommend everybody to read the paper because it's present a very clear and informative analysis of China PLAN's Indo emerging Indo-Pacific uh, naval strategy. And that uh, strategy, I think, uh, confirmed a number of long-standing speculation outside China about uh, Beijing's strategic ambition and when the country's uh, power and interest uh, growing strongly. And firstly, the, uh, his paper confirmed the speculation that China is seeking naval presence, uh, primacy in the Indo-Pacific region. And that is characterized by China's emerging Indo-Pacific uh, Navy strategy, which is defined by expanding naval activity in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, developing a Korea-centric uh, force structure, and seeking and to establish overseas military base and uh, shift from sea denial to staged sea control strategy. That are the point made by Professor Yu in his paper. And China currently shifted its previously sea denial strategy to a staged sea control. And from a sea control of near sea to intermediate sea, that is South China Sea, and far sea, that is broader Indo-Pacific region. So that is concerning because that will lead to, and what Professor Yu said, the Indo-Pacific region will become battleground between US and China. So that's the first thing which I found disturbing. And the second thing is that uh, I found is that South China Sea is a very important uh, part in China's emerging Indo-Pacific uh, naval strategy. And uh, so if you read the Professor Yu's paper, you will find that uh, China's land reclamation and uh, uh, activity in the South China Sea, especially in Spratly Island, has strategic purpose. And it's become very important part for China to develop that so-called, uh, uh, Professor, you just said, one point, one zone, and one line, which is uh, and to develop uh, uh, emerging uh, line around the China strategic uh, sea line of uh, communication. and. Uh, uh, from China, you know, the coast to the uh, uh, Indo-Pacific region. So in that case, if, if that is true, then anyone who hopes that China will move back the, its, its assertive behavior in South China Sea will be disappointed. And uh, because not only that's a territorial issue, but uh, South China Sea, especially those artificial islands in the Spratly Island, become important uh, military 
uh, base for China's uh, emerging Indo-Pacific Navy strategy. So the third uh, disturbing concern is that uh, which concluded by the uh, Professor Yu in his paper is that uh, and uh, China's growing and ambitious and uh, Indo-Pacific Navy activity and strategy will lead to strategic rivalry, not only with the US, but perhaps with India as well. So that's the three disturbing issues I found from his paper, and I do not disagree with those findings. But now I think uh, with this funding, that is, uh, if, if, if that is true, then that is quite serious for regional stability. And so what I want uh, to ask Professor Yu on a number of questions, and uh, which I think uh, that related to the emerging strategy. So the first question is that I want uh, Professor Yu to tell us, is that the emerging Indo-Pacific naval strategy a well-considered strategy based on rational calculation of China's national interest, or it is based on deeply flawed assumption and calculation about China's strategic need. And I ask this question partly because Professor Yu already mentioned his opp opposition about that uh, China's development of Korea-centric uh, Navy and that is vulnerable to uh, attack in any of the major battles with another major sea power. But uh, still, despite of his opposition, China still moved towards that direction to develop Korea-centric uh, na Blue Water Navy. So is that a wise move on the part of China, or it is driven by something which is actually against China's own national interest? The question is actually, I raise that question based on the big academic and policy conduct raised in the by a uh, 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 well-known American scholar Robert Bates about uh, China's uh, recent uh, move towards the Blue Water Navy. And uh, there is a debate about whether that move is actually driven by a miscalculation about China's national interest uh, and by domestic nationalist sentiment, uh, which is a Blue Water Navy symbol of uh, greater power because According to some people in this debate, that China is actually essentially a continental power, and it faces strategic pressure from the land border and from the sea. And as a land-based continental power, historically, no such power can achieve naval primacy and uh, uh, like the previous example of Germany. And uh, so, and Professor Yu already provided some evidence for this is that 1.5 war scenario and a land uh, dispute uh, create generated war with India and the maritime war with somebody else. And if that happens, it might not be a 1.5 war, it might be a two war. So would China be able to meet the challenge to fight two war, and one land war and one maritime war with two major power at the same time. So if not, then what actually driven China's blue water strategy? And uh, even with all the obvious vulnerability mentioned by Professor Yu and mentioned in the debate about uh, the uh, some of the disadvantages for China to develop, you know, uh, blue water navy. The other problem which I want to challenge China's Indo-Pacific Navy strategy is, is something which I call the myth of the protecting sea land of uh, strategic communication. And uh, David uh, in his presentation and Professor Yu in his presentation and all made the point that uh, China's intention and one of the key driver for China to develop Blue Water Navy is to protect uh, its sea line of communication and that is vulnerable to US blockade uh, in a major war. But that uh, issue is actually needed to be put uh, into perspective. And firstly, and uh, 
the U.S. will be very unlikely, according to you know the reasonable well, you know uh, research the analysis on this from the U.S. Navy War College. U.S. will be very unlikely to blockade uh, the sea line of a communication unless there is a major war between China and the U.S. But uh, what will cause a major war between China and the United States? And people can name it, and uh, Taiwan, and uh, does that China already? Without the sea control and the ability to protect the sea line of communication, already developed sufficient uh, deter deterrence capability to the United States. And so, what else could make China and the U.S. fight a major war and not a, a small clash? That is South China Sea. But why is that South China Sea will cause China and the U.S. into a major war? It is because China's Navy expansion want to control that area for the sake to protect uh, its sea line of communication. So protecting sea line of communication itself now become a cause of major war rather than something, you know, as a consequences of a need, uh, you know, of a major war. So in that case, the, the, to develop that uh, ability to protect uh, sea line of communication, which actually if we follow some saying, and it's resembled to something like committing suicide for the fear of death. And of uh, course, you want to protect something which is vulnerable in the war, but the effort to prepare might cause a war itself. So that is the first thing. The second thing, there are better ways, even if there is a possibility to protect the sea line of communication. But there are better ways for China to deal with that risk, and which is less costly and more effective. That is through land, overland pipeline. China has already done this through Central Asia, through this One Belt, One Road initiative, which is One Belt. The Chinese view, the Chinese intention to build up a port in the Guadal and in Burma, etc. They already started to build those land-based pipeline for energy and gas to avoid the so-called Malacca dilemma. And that both can help China to reduce the risk and also reduce the suspicions of India and the United States and reduce the chance for confrontation. But why does China choose to develop this very ambitious sea control-oriented Indo-Pacific uh, naval strategy, even if with so many uh, uh, vulnerability, which pointed out by Professor Yu's uh, paper. So firstly, I want to ask Professor Yu, is that the strategy based uh, yearly considered uh, or actually it's a wise strategy? Secondly, if there is so many problems about the Korea centric for structure, why does China still want to do it? And uh, so, and my second question is that uh, uh, in, I, I just want to give all this, I uh, just want Professor Yu and uh, to give us a uh, view that uh, uh, well, China of course faces a tremendous challenge to achieve with the so-called Indo-Pacific uh, emerging naval strategy. So I would like uh, to know that uh, uh, within the, uh, if we take into account the domestic uh, external uh, challenge, and what are the biggest challenges in your view that faced by China to make that strategy succeed? So I will stop here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zhang. Um, I think you raised some really excellent questions that push this whole discussion along. And um, I'd like to invite Professor Yeo to, to respond. You can you can stay there, and we'll uh, fold this into the, the, the remainder of the Q and A. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Zhang Jian, for your excellent questions, which I cannot answer effectively or confidently. Um, on strategy, I forgot the name. Uh, the gen American general says the professional, the amateur talks about strategy and the professional talks about logistics. I'm amateur, so it's easier, <laughs> it's easier and uh, uh, even careless, it doesn't matter whether you are careless or not to talk about strategy, it will happen. It may not happen. Uh, it, 
may disappear next year or whatever for political reasons. But uh, what I'm trying to say here is that there is a mentality, a, a sense from the PRA writings that now you talk about slog safety. Uh, slog warfare, slog safety issue is a basic Sino US relationship issue. Um, I think on this particular point, Obama is right. He says that China is taking free ride on American protection of nine ground waterways globally. I think the free ride we call public goods provided by the United States uh, that benefit the Chinese enormously in the last 30 years. Um, the, the issue, the problem is that the Chinese war planners do not trust this kind of US protection of global waterways can last forever. And someday, what if Americans blockade the Chinese ceilings of communications? Now, I, we do some research on uh, ARC battle concept. Uh, Australians are required to blockade the, the Chinese southern route of sea trade. Um, we, we, we did some calculation that we find out um, the, sh the number of ships that the Australian Navy have to intercept or blockade uh, is much bigger from the from Australian shipping companies than from the Chinese shipping companies. Uh, it, that, that is to say that if things go that bad, the global economy, everyone will be badly affected. Uh, it, it will be the last thing Americans are trying to do. But if you come to this conclusion that the Sino-US military confrontation is inevitable, you now it is quite natural for naval planners to think about you know, this kind of prospect of naval blockade against each other you know, for the United States is the cheapest way to battle China for the Chinese way, for the Chinese thinking. It is a very vulnerable point for them to do it. Therefore, all these are behind those kind of military build up, naval build up uh, for the scenario that one day Americans will turn, up, turn their back on us. Now we have to have capabilities to protect ourselves. So when we talk about this uh, selective sea control capabilities beyond the South China Sea, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm amateur, so I can talk about strategy, but when you talk about the real battlefield, the combat situation, you need to calculate you know, the warships, the missiles, the aircraft. Now, I think this needs a lot of simulation exercises. You know, that is something beyond me. But here, uh, from my perspective, the, at least Malacca Street is one of the places <coughs> the Chinese have to do something about it, like selective sea control, at least the selective uh, sea denial uh, outcome. And, uh, uh, but generally speaking, we are t in a very exciting period. The, crowd, the world is developing so fast and so dramatically. You know, we, we can go this way, have a sino US military confrontation. That all, everything we said today, we, everything we have said today will make sense. And we can continue to go the other way that cooperation you know, um, takes the presence take the more you know, uh, important position than geostrategic strife, then we'll have different story, yeah. Thank you. And in thinking about this question of whether perhaps China's, or uh, if China were to pursue a strategy of sea control uh, in the Indian Ocean, whether or not that's a mistake, I'm reminded by um, some comments uh, from the Pentagon in the 1980s about the jostling between the United States and the Soviet Navy in the Indian Ocean. And uh, when, when, when asked about this, uh, the senior Pentagon uh, official responded, he thought it was a great thing because it was uh, distracting the uh, Soviet Navy from the main game and essentially, you know, uh, the, the, the more Soviet naval ships were in the Indian Ocean, the better. 
um, because they would be away from the real real centres of action. So that's a sort of an interesting um, uh, analogy. So if I could uh, ask uh, if anyone uh, has some questions. Yes. <coughs> Uh, Qing Dongyuan, uh, University of Sydney. Uh, is this uh, a comment rather than a uh, question? Uh, but maybe a, a question as well. Is the comment is that I think we tend to a little bit over uh, exaggerate the, uh, the the situation. In, in, for instance, for uh, between the United States and China uh, over their conflict and rivalry over South China Sea, where. If you, if you read the uh, recent report about the uh, White House is uh, often trying to uh, interject some caution into the, the PACOM, you know, the, the, sort of what, what kind of statement or the actual behavior, even for freedom of navigation, you know, is very, very limited in, in, in numbers and very carefully uh, managed. So I think there's a, Diff, there's a gap between what the reality or the actual governments are are thinking and doing because this is a serious matter. You know, uh, it's easy to get into conflict between two nuclear powers. I mean, how do you get out? Right. So, so you don't want to get into that kind of a situation. Uh, so that's one one point. Second one is related to Indian Ocean and China's uh, expanding uh, presence to the Indian Ocean. I mean, if you look at China's uh, economic development over the last 20, 30 years, this is a international foreign trade dependent yeah. GDP. 40% of its GDP is, is, is through, uh, realized through foreign trade, right? So 45% of the foreign trade is import. And a half of that is uh, raw material uh, resources, uh, uh, crude oil and all of that, right? And then 80% through Indian Ocean maritime uh, shipment. Of course, China is worried about this uh, ceiling of uh, communication. Uh, so there's a tendency uh, of talking about maritime capabilities, naval capacities, escorting. But I think still there's a long way for Chinese Navy to, to realize uh, a full capacity to do escort control fighting any potential sort of opponents in the Indian Ocean. So now it's a very, very limited capacity. So here I think there are ample opportunities. Instead of being worried about all these, you know, rivalry and arms race, because I could imagine, as you mentioned, a vulnerability. Let's imagine China removed vulnerability. What that means for India, for all the rest, right? It would mean have hundreds of uh, Chinese ships all year round, you know, that creates serious security dilemma. So there need to be better communication and consultation to, to, to develop some coordination. So at least you, uh, you know, remove or control any miscalculation and to turn it a more uh, sort of a win-win, or at least you know, manage those conflictual uh, aspects. Because at the end of the day, as I mentioned, 40% of Chinese uh, foreign trade, a large percentage will go to the United States, go to Europe, go to Japan, and go to South Korea, and some of them also go to India. Um, would I no, it's okay. Sorry. Yeah. I agree, I totally agree. Uh, Dr. Yu, thank you very much for your presentation. It was fascinating. Uh, Dr. Malcolm Davis, Australian Strategic Policy Institute. Um, we're looking today, obviously, at um, Chinese-Indian uh, strategic dynamics through a naval lens, but I don't think you can totally look at it purely through a naval lens in a, in a period where the PLA is moving determinedly to achieve integrated joint operations as, uh, alongside informationization. So I wanted to get your thoughts on how the PLA Air Force and the PLA Rocket Forces would play a role in Chinese strategy for the Indian Ocean, uh, given the sort of long-range conventional ballistic missile capabilities that the PLA Rocket Forces are starting to develop and the future long-range airstrike capabilities for the PLA Air Force. And also, could you comment on the strategic support forces in terms of space and cyberspace? and how they would play a role in contrib contributing to uh, Chinese strategy in the Indian Ocean. Thank you. You want to have a, a group of... Or... No, no, let's, let's do it yeah. one by one. Uh, 
that's a very, very important question. I'm dealing with the naval aspect of it, uh, but uh, my research goes way beyond that. Uh, the, we, we talk about the reach out, but another concept is we call it combat reach. That is not uh, about your, the capability of your ship sailing through certain areas, but you, you engage in serious combat uh, in those regions. Uh, now, this in Chinese, uh, we, we calculated, we measured by strategic air cover. So the comp if the uh, air cover cannot reach certain area, you only have the ordinary, you call freedom of navigation sails rather than combat uh, operations. Uh, so the yeah, you are right. So that is one of the reasons why the Chinese have been developing those long-range strategic aircraft. Uh, okay. For example, the J, uh, sorry, the Y20. So that will change the combat situation in sino India land borders because the reinforcement can be flowing in very, very fast. And uh, the Chinese is, you know, I think is quite successful in developing strategic bombers that was announced by Chinese Air Commander Ma Xiaotian just a few weeks ago. So the laboratory design, the, the, the laboratory tests of those materials, the, those have, that, that phase has been over. So pretty soon you will see the, the first trial of the strategic bomber, uh, the stealth, uh, long range, and uh, uh, have large uh, payroll. So when this happens, you know, together with the full combat capacity or capability of carrier battle groups, and together with the, the two new services you mentioned, the strategic mm -hmm. support forces, uh, which is which aggregates the Chinese internet force, the uh, electronic uh, force, uh, the space force. So this could provide the information in interconnectivity, the, the real time. Uh, vital field situation. Oh, only when all these things are available, can we talk about, uh, like uh, Dr. Yuan mentioned, the, the so-called the full-fledged naval engagement in the Indian Ocean. So this is a long, long way to go. But I, I agree with uh, both uh, 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 Professor Zhang and Professor Yuan that you know it is not a priority because the Sino. Indian border disputes are under control, and neither side want to escalate to the point of a war. And the slog is a simple, we call it a hypothetical threat rather than real threat. That will be the case for a long, long time to come. So these PRA planners, they go a long way than the reality that, that is needed. That is my worry. I'm not worried about the worry Zhang Jian and the Yuan Jindu mentioned earlier, I'm worried about why you should be quiet. You should be silent, you talk too loud. You know, that alarm everybody else in the region. Yeah. Dr. Zheng, did you uh, want to say anything? Yes, uh, I do not think China currently already had a clear integrated strategy by using Navy strategic supporting force and uh, the wrecked, uh, you know, uh, Army plus uh, Air Force. But uh, I would say, if there is, uh, you know, a, a, a fighting combat scenario, and the other kind of service, well, in the maritime uh, domain, and the other forces will be largely used to distract, and uh, to, you know, uh, the 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 adversaries uh, uh, focus or attention, rather than to become an integrated uh, uh, force and fighting together. So that's how I would say China will start the cyber attack uh, and use strategic, uh, you know, supporting forces to do very things. And uh, uh, but rather, I do not think currently they have a very clearly made the integrated strategy focus on and uh, that uh, sea control of that uh, Indo-Pacific region. Um, and if I could just. I use my position to ask a quick follow-up question to Professor Yeo. To what extent do you think that the PLA Air Force has the same broad vision that the PLA Navy may have? So is the PLA Air Force 
making the same plans about creating uh, basing access in the Indian Ocean region as the PLA Navy may, may be? Uh, the simple answer is that uh, there's no question that the Air Force can reach almost every part of South China Sea. But if it involves another major power in the Indian Ocean, it requires um, a strategic air base or naval base uh, along the Indian Ocean region. Uh, I think Guadalajara would be one of the choices they can look to. And a number of other places, they are looking into it at the moment. Uh, you, you cannot, uh, even if you have the strategic bomber, like uh, uh, B-2 or B-52, or without uh, the uh, forward uh, military base in the Indian Ocean region, it's still very, very difficult. Uh, for uh, strategic missions to be carried out. Technical missions could be okay, but strategic missions are out of question. Yeah. Uh, Yoshizan Ishii from the Embassy of Japan. Uh, Professor Yo, I found your views very interesting. Um, I have a question about um, what we should see as markers in the future, should your uh, theory prove um, to be maybe 10 years down the line. We think in retrospect that you're right or you're wrong, but. Um, uh, for example, one example is whether ADIZ will be introduced in South China Sea is one marker that we all have in the back of our minds right now, perhaps. But I was wondering, to, based on your theory, what sort of markers we should be looking out for in 10 years' time? For example, are there any things, uh, new ideas or concepts that could be introduced along the lines? Or is there something we should be looking around for the Morocco Straits? Or maybe when the base made in Guadar um, is this in Pakistan, right? I think. Qatar, yes. Qatar in Pakistan. Yeah. So um, I was wondering if there are any markers for us to be thinking about um, when when we reflect on your theory. Do you mean Malacca Street? Uh, no, just Ma in general. Ma like Ma I, I, I can't really think yeah. of. Yeah. The reason why I ask this is it's hard for me. To, it's hard for me to think of like land reclamation in uh, yeah. uh, Indian Ocean or ADIZ in the yeah. in the in the Indian yeah. Ocean. That sounds really too far fetched, yeah. but. There will probably be more things that that are more easily understood and, um, and tangible things that that you have in mind. Yeah. Thank you. I think China is vulnerable if Malacca Street is blocked or other major waterways are blocked against Chinese shipment. Um, but the Chinese do have uh, options uh, as a major military power, as I mentioned earlier. Yeah. That we call the reverse deterrence. You block us, you know especially for the Japanese ships. Can you go through the, your normal sea lanes back to your ports, uh, I, I, back I, to Japan? <laughs> I, I doubt it. I think the Chinese will do something uh, to uh, blockade other countries, mm. uh, sea lanes of communications elsewhere, if in the, not in the Malacca Street. So that, that will be the world war. Uh, mm. I think uh, no country is wanting that, I think uh, Jin Dong and uh, Professor Zhang also mentioned, I think no Japanese want to see such thing happen. The problem is, however, you know, uh, once um, probably most, are, most of my friends I communicate uh, in the United States are the military people, defense, uh, DOD people. So they see, you know, the strategic debate in the US elites, whether China is competitor, pure, we call pure competitor, or stakeholder, it's over. They point to the direction that China is depicted as a pure competitor, then Americans are doing those kind of preparations for the worst scenarios. So the Chinese, so do the Chinese. Now this is, a, the problem for us is that, you know, including Australia, including South Korea and those American allies that, you know, when they have come to this point that eventually, uh, I, I do not uh, totally agree to Yuan, uh, Professor Yuan's relatively uh, optimistic evaluation. Uh, maybe you read those AR specialists more, I read the defense planners more, uh, then there is a big gap in between them that you stimulate the Chinese. Now, uh, Admiral Harris said, we can fight tonight. At the same time, you, you sti stimulate the Chinese, and Chinese try to respond to the threat.
by building up military capabilities on the one hand, then you tell the Chinese, we will not fight against you militarily. So this is a fundamental question, whether it is better to have Americans continue to provide the public goods of protecting nine ground waterways in the ocean, or you let the Chinese have their own capabilities to protect themselves of their slugs. Now we do not have answer because there's a lot of tricky area in between. Americans want to say, now once we turn our back on you, you, you have no chance to respond. So the Chinese think, oh, if they do such, such a things, we have to respond. You know, this is a security dilemma. Can I add something on this? Yeah. Uh, I think for the ADIZ uh, in South China Sea, I do not think China had uh, intention and a need, uh, and in, at least uh, for uh, uh, in near near future, uh, to declare ADIZ because the situation when China declared ADIZ in East China Sea and South China Sea is very different. So many people see China's declaration as a provocative move, and uh, also China, many people currently see. China's assertiveness was uh, uh, a cause for the regional uh, instability and in both South China and East China Sea. But in Chinese view, actually, they see this as a so-called strategy of deterrence through assertiveness. What does that mean is that they want to deter the other party from provocation by showing stronger assertiveness. So when China become tougher, they hope that they can deter the other party which are in dispute with China, stop provocative behavior and uh, uh, from the Chinese view. So in that case, ADIZ in East China Sea happened in the, city, in the context of uh, escalating China-Japan uh, dispute over the disputed island. So for China to stop that escalation is to accelerate. And Just, that, 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 that sounds like uh, uh, counter, uh, counter, yeah. counter intrusive. And by showing tougher than the other party, they want to stop the other. So in that case, uh, for the ADIZ, they declared. Uh, and the other thing, it seems to me, and uh, Professor, you know more, much more about no, this. No. I know he wrote on this. <laughs> and the other thing for me is that uh, a declaration on that uh, ADIZ at that time is also for domestic political consideration. And tough on Japan is always very good, and for the Chinese leader. So I'm, uh, 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 but uh, in the East China Sea, China also take that uh, strategy of deterrence through assertiveness. And China quite assertive in recent years, and China feel, regardless of external view, China feel it works. It stopped the other calamity country yeah. taking provocative behavior like a few years ago. And no land reclamation by Vietnam, no land reclamation by any other country in the South China Sea since China started. We can do faster, larger, better. So if you want to do this, well, they did this first. And the second thing is that, so, so, so in that case, when the South China Sea situation currently uh, relatively stable, there was no need for ADIZ. Yeah. And uh, so I, I do not think China, and also there was no domestic or political yeah. gain and by declaring ADIZ now. So, so, it's, so that's my yeah. uh, Just a little bit, uh, I think Professor Zhang is right in, on this particular point, but I'd like to add a little bit details, a little bit detailed information. I think the ADIZ will be declared in the South China Sea, but not in the Spratlys, in the past, under territorial disputes, but in the non-disputed area we call the Hainan Island, where the Chinese strategic nuclear uh, submarine base, when, where the Chinese strategic space launching base are located, because the, the very foundation, a purpose for ADRZ is to provide more early warning time for your air defense. This is, this is not really about a sovereignty claim. Uh, now in the Spratlys, China have, China hasn't even declared that we call the ba uh, uh, boundary base points and the baselines. How could you declare uh, ADIZ uh, without this kind of fundamental you know, necessary uh, data? So this, this is a basic thing. Yeah. I guess my question is a pretty simple or simplistic one, really. Clearly, we're going through a period of major power balance change in the world. 
and it's therefore completely understandable that various parties will be adopting hedging strategies, and that's what we've been hearing a deal about this morning. Um, but when you look at it uh, logically and strategically, um, and I'm aware of the history of antipathy between India and China, or China and India, um, and I'm trying to bring the conversation back to the China-India question, um, why wouldn't China and India seek to come to some kind of better accommodation? Because for both of them, um, they require economic stability, economic growth. Uh, they both have different vulnerabilities. Um, you know, we seem to be premising our whole conversation today, and, and it happens in the media and elsewhere, on this idea of competition and therefore leading to some kind of conflict. But uh, why isn't uh, another type of scenario possible, uh, or am I just being overly simplistic? Thank you. Okay, thanks. From Lee, why don't we be friends? Um, and, and I'm sorry, I don't make, to mean to make fun because it, it does obviously make a lot of sense, and I'd like to hear uh, comments from our, pa our panel about that. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Yuji and uh, Zhang. Uh, my question is that in uh, what roles, if any, uh, do the North Koreans and Pakistanis have to pl have a play, uh, a play in China's naval strategy? There's a lot of emphasis given to um, on China's relations with its partners in uh, with its um, neighboring countries and literal states in the South China Sea and potential flashpoints that may emerge because of those relation, those countries that may have relate, uh, alliance relationships with the United States. If that were to be flipped around, uh, China to some extent has a, I wouldn't go so far as saying an alliance, but it has a partnership with uh, Pakistan and uh, probably a closer relationship with North Korea. So do these countries feature in its calculus as it seeks out to pursue its naval strategy? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the first question from the gentleman, I think the Sino-Indian cooperation, China is very happy to see that happen. Uh, China is even happy to tell the Indians that we want to pay for it to happen. For example, let us let our ship go through it peacefully. Now we can pay you in other forms. For example, investing more in your country, infrastructure, manufacturing industries, and so on and so forth. Just let us go. Now this, uh, this, is a, this is a mutual benefit. It's a shared uh, ground for cooperation is there. Uh, the problem is really about land dispute. Sometimes they prevent a lot of things from happening. And of course, history like 1962 war, Dalai Lama issue. Now this kind of, we call uh, conflicts of structural, structural conflicts of interest, they are there. Uh, that prevent a lot of things from happening. But the Chinese do, the Chinese do have a lot of uh, caution not to, let me say, make Indians unhappy in a sense. Uh, to answer your question, young gentleman's question, no, Pakistan reads to the Chinese many times during the Hu Jintao presidency that please come to Guada and build a military base there. Chinese refused numerous times. No, no. Why they refuse? Largely to care about Indians' concern. India does, if China does have a strategic base there, you know, what the Indians would think about it, you know? So, but things are evolving, you know, what Hu Jintao refused to do may, may not mean that Xi Jinping will follow the suit. But the Chinese do, do care, do, the Chinese does care, and do care and do concern about India. You know, in a way, China does have some level of sensitivity. <laughs> Dr. Zhang, did you? No, I agree. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you. I think we'll break there. Just to add um, a, a, a couple of little thoughts in um, about China's um, strategy, naval strategy in the Indian Ocean, and that's also to the question, the realis realism of that strategy. And I think you touched on that. Um, thinking back, when was the last? major slock protection campaign in in history, and that was probably the Battle of the Atlantic in the 1940s, when we had much, much shorter sea lanes 
between the two, probably the uh, two of the biggest world powers, both of which were uh, applying a significant proportion of their national power to protect those sea lanes, and they they only were just able to. And so, one raises that, that I think that reinforces your point about really how realistic yeah. would it ever be for uh, China to attempt to attempt a sea control strategy in the Indian Ocean, which involved protection of its entire sea lane.